The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Today, hundreds of people all over the country receive phone calls from their Equitable Society representatives. Phone calls like this one. Hello? Hello, Jack. This is your Equitable representative. Oh, hello. What's new? Well, Jack, I thought you and your wife might be interested in getting a copy of a new chart just published by the Equitable Society. It's called a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Why, it might be. What's it all about? Well, tonight on This Is Your FBI, you'll hear exactly what the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers is all about. So be sure to listen to the middle commercial. Yes, in about 15 minutes, Dad and Mother, it will pay you to hear all the facts about the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Plastic Profile. Eight years ago, in 1940, the number of crimes committed in this country was far below the number now being committed by America's huge army of criminals. With the larger number of crimes has come a greater number of convictions, a greater number of people being sent to prison. And yet, back in 1940, when the last United States census was taken, the number of our fellow citizens who gave their residence as prison was appallingly large. More than 317,000. If that number does not sufficiently impress you, then perhaps you should consider that in these 48 states, with a population of more than 130 million, there were only 25 cities housing more people than are currently held in our prisons. Tonight's file opens in a cell in a small prison located in the town in one of our northwestern states. It is early morning, and through the bars can be seen a heavy snowstorm. There are two men in the cell, and one of them is just waking up. Hello there. Mm. Well, when did you come in? Last night? Must have been after I went to sleep. It was. Hey, don't I know you from someplace? I don't believe so. You live around here? No, no. Just passing through. Somehow I know I've seen you kiss her before. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Now I know. There's a picture of you on a circular in the post office. I seen it last week. Huh. Funny I should remember. Just seeing it once like that. Everybody does. Especially the police. That's why I'm here. My name's Joe Crawford. Hello, Joe. I'm Slim Baldwin. What are you in for? They're holding me for the FBI. Wow, that's bad. What's that? Quiet. Give me that stick. Who are you talking to? A friend of mine. Ox Putman. He sends very well. You can understand this? Of course. He just asked us at a time for busting out of here. That's right. Would uh, Mr. Ox Putnam object to company? Not if the company kept his mouth shut. <laughs> One of my specialties. Okay. Then we all go tonight. <laughs> Next morning at the local railroad station, Special Agent Jim Taylor is met by Sergeant Roberts of the local police. Hello, hello, Jim. Yeah. Hello. How are you? Okay, guy. 
Well, looks like you've had some typical weather. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the weatherman says it really hasn't stopped snowing yet. He thinks it'll start again in about an hour. Well, I'll be gone by then, I hope. Well, I don't think so, Jim. I got some bad news. Why, what's wrong, Jeff? Well, the man you came up to get broke out of jail last night. What? Hey, broke out with two others. One of them was caught here at the railroad station. The other, a man named Joe Crawford, still missing. Then he and Baldwin might be together, huh? Yeah, maybe. Let's get going, huh? Okay. Jeff, how'd they get out? Well, Crawford told the guard he wanted to see the warden. Mm-hmm. When the guard opened the door, Crawford grabbed his arm, knocked him down, took his keys. Once they got those, they were as good as out. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I remember that cracker box jail you have here. Hey, I thought they were going to build you a new jailhouse. Well, there was a referendum at the last election. People voted against it. Doesn't make much sense to have a good police force in a bad jail. <laughs> That's what we tried to tell everybody. Now, here we are, Jim. This is the car. Thank you. Let's head back to the office and see if there's been any word. Is the hideout very far now? No, no. It's that cabin down at the end of the road. See the smoke coming out of the chimney? Huh, someone there? Yeah, Aunt Mary. Your aunt? No, no, she runs the hideaway. Oh. You can hold up there as long as you want. Well, I won't be staying long. I've got to get back to Seattle. Got a dame there? No. Got some money stashed there. Well, you better not make your move too soon. They'll be throwing plenty of pictures of you around. You know how that kisser of yours stays with people. Oh, that's true. Hey. What is it? Yeah, I got a great idea for you, Slim. Why don't you get a new face? Well, I've considered that, but I never had the time. Well, you'll have the time now. And Aunt Mary knows a guy who does the best plastic work in the whole state. A legitimate doctor? Well, he was once. He knows all the angles. Why don't you give him a try, huh? Uh, I'll think it over. Okay. Well, here we are. Is this Aunt Mary's? Yeah. Oh, boy. <sighs> You'll have to plow through the snow a little. That's all right. Can you make it okay? Sure, sure. You suppose she's home? Oh, sure, sure. She's always home. Hello, Aunt Mary. Joe Crawford. <laughs> That's come right. Come in, come in, Joe. Yeah, go ahead, Slim, that boy. Oh, oh, it's got a fire in here. Yeah, it feels good. Aunt Mary, this is Slim Baldwin. Well, how do you do, Slim? Hello, Aunt Mary. We, uh, we just busted out of jail. You did? Yeah. Well, bless you both. Let me fix you a nice hot meal. Busy, Aunt Mary? Oh, no, come in, Joe. I thought you went in to take a nap. Oh, I'm not tired. Oh, where's your friend, Slim? Oh, he's sleeping. He was knocked out. Oh, poor boy. Is he an old friend, Joe? No, nah, no. Nah, I never seen him till yesterday. He was being held for the FBI. They had circulars on him all over town. Well, my, I'm flattered to have a celebrity in the house. He's too much celebrity. That's his trouble. What do you mean? Everybody knows his kisser. That's why he got picked up. Oh, what a shame. Say, Aunt Mary, is that plastic doc that you used to know still around? No, you mean Doc Smith? Yeah, that's the guy. No, he died a few months ago. Oh, that's too bad. I had a chance for us to make a real good commission. How's that? Well, I talked to Slim on the way out about having his kisser fixed. And a few minutes ago, I started on him again. Yes? He finally decided to have it done. I said you could get Doc Smith for the job. I, uh, said it would cost him five G's. What did he say to that? <laughs> he said he'd pay it. He did? Yeah, yeah, he's got some dough stashed up in Seattle. Well, Joseph, we, we can't let money like that slip through our fingers. Well, what can you do? I know another doctor. Huh? I'll have him here tonight. <laughs> Jeff, how did you get Baldwin? Oh, we just recognized him from the wanted circular and picked him up. What was his specialty, anyway? Jewel theft. A lot of women thought he was attractive. That's the way he earned his money. Oh, I see. On his last job, he picked up a woman on a train. She was a maid. He talked her into lifting her boss's jewelry. On the train? That's right. 
Hey, who is this uh, Joe Crawford that he escaped with? Well, he's wanted for murder. He uh, shot a cashier in a local factory. Got about 30000 in cash. But fortunately, he had it all on him when he was arrested. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Robert speaking. Yeah? They did? Well, when? Oh, I see. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Gordon. Uh, what was that number again? Uh-huh. Yeah, all right, I got it. Thanks a lot. We got a break, Jim. That was a farmer named Gordon. Baldwin and Crawford knocked him out and stole his car early this morning. How come he didn't report it until now? But he just came to. Oh. Well, let's get a good description on the car and send an alarm right away. Right. And, Jeff, I think I'll go out and have a talk with Mr. Gordon. Here, uh, here's some more wood for the fire, Aunt Mary. Oh, aren't you the good boy, Joe? <laughs> Say, is uh, Slim still sleeping? No, he's been in here visiting with me. I-, I just sent him back to his room. Get ready for the doctor. Oh, when's he coming? He should be here any minute. Did you, uh, did you talk to Slim about the dough? Yes, I, I told him I arranged everything with the doctor. I told him that he didn't have to pay till he got back to Seattle. Did you tell him that we'd go up with him to collect? Oh, yes, mm-hmm. Ha, <laughs> swell. Well, there. How's that for a fire, huh? Oh, that's beautiful. You know, it reminds me of a building my departed husband once set fire to. <laughs> and Mary, you killed me. Oh, that's probably the doctor now. Let him in. Well, hello, doctor. Hello, Mary. Well, come in, won't you? Yeah, thank you. Uh. Joe, this is Dr. Montgomery. Oh, uh, Doc, this is Joe Crawford. Hiya, Doc. Fine, fine. Let me have your coat. Uh, sure. There we are. Sure. Goodness, where are your rubbers? Huh? Uh, must have forgot them. This the patient? No, he's in his bedroom. Do you think you can do the job tonight, Doc? Sure, no trouble at all. Got all the instruments in my little black bag. What kind of a face are you going to give the guy? What kind would he like? What kind you got? All kinds. He can look like he ate Southern, Robert Mantel. Oh, how glamorous. Who are them guys? Oh, they're very handsome men. Uh, but, Doctor, why don't you talk to the patient? After all, he's the one who'll have to make the choice. He's in his bedroom, Doctor. You go right in. Very well, very well. Hey, Aunt Mary. Yes, Joseph? Uh, this may not be the right thing to ask, but has the doctor been drinking? Of course. How can he operate? Operate? Well, the only time he's used a knife in his life is to put butter on his bread. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Jack? Jack? With those youngsters of yours growing as fast as they are, here's something you'll want to see. It's called a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Fact-finding chart? How's that going to help me? It'll help you, Jack, because you're the kind of man who isn't afraid to face facts squarely. For example, what would happen to your wife and children if you should die unexpectedly? Would they be able to make out all right? Would they have enough money to keep well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? When you put it that way, Mr. Keating, I couldn't say. But that... Fact-finding chart sounds kind of complicated. Not a bit, Jack. It's the simplest thing in the world. With the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart, you'll have your answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you're finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Hold your horses, Mr. Keating. What do you mean, critical years? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. I see what you mean, Mr. Keating. I guess I ought to get this fact-finding chart. How much do they charge for it? (laughs) Jack, it doesn't cost you a single cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with them, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone in tomorrow to bring you an Equitable Fact-Finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or 
Send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Plastic Profile. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI lays bare the primary emotion of every criminal, the desire to get his hands on what belongs to someone else. No matter what the cost in physical pain or mental torture might be to the victim. When we in this nation reach a point where every person in every section is truly a civilized human being, then there will be no more crime waves, nor any criminals. Because the true stamp of civilization is a deep compassion for your fellow human beings. But until we reach that utopian day, it is our bounden duty to cooperate at every turn with our local police and with every other law enforcement agency to see to it that the war against crime is waged successfully. Tonight's file continues in the small office of Sergeant Roberts of the local police. Jeff, Jeff, can I come in? Oh, come ahead, Jeff. Did you get to see Mr. Gordon? Yes. Yes, he had a pretty nasty blow on the head. Well, could he give you anything? Yes, I showed him Baldwin's picture on the wanted circular and that picture of Crawford that you had. Uh-huh. He identified both as the men who stole his car. Well, at least we're sure of that much. Well, if they stay on any main highway, they should be picked up pretty soon, huh? I would think so, Jim. That alarm has been on the local radio station every 15 minutes since this morning. Uh-huh. No problem, Robert speaking. Huh? Yes, Mr. Atkinson. When? You sure? Yes, I see. All right. Thank you very much. I was a Mr. Atkinson, Jim. He just heard the alarm on the radio. And he saw the car? Yeah. When? This afternoon. It went past his house up Nine Mile Hill. Where's that? Oh, about 35 miles from here. Mm-hmm. He also said that he noticed the car because it was the only one that went past his house today. We might be able to follow the tracks, then, if it doesn't snow again. Yes, we can get out there first thing in the morning. We don't have to go by car, Jim. We've got a helicopter. I'll fly us out there as soon as it gets light. Hey, Aunt Mary. What is it, Jules? Slim ain't dead, is he? What precious? What makes you think that? Well, I just looked in that room where he is. He, he's out cold. Well, naturally. Oh, is that... Is, is, is he supposed to be that way? Well, the doctor was very generous with the chloroform. Oh. How long will he be out? About another hour. Then can he take off those bandages? No, son. They won't come off for a few weeks yet. What? But I don't want to wait here that long. You won't have to. He can travel as soon as he regains consciousness. With his head all bandaged like that? Well, of course. I'll get him a cap with earmuffs, then with his coat collar turned up, no one will notice him. Uh, I hope that car we picked up holds together until we get to Seattle. Oh, we're not using that car. Hmm? Might be hot. Uh, we'll use Doc Montgomery's. What about the doctor's dough? He's already gotten everything he's going to get. You, you paid him? Gave him two bottles of whiskey. That should keep him very happy. Suppose the doctor gets in touch with Slim and asks for his dough. How's he going to do that? Well, I saw Slim write down his address on a pad for the doc. As soon as he has a couple more drinks, get it back from him. <laughs> right. Now, give me a hand here. I'm looking for something. What, Aunt Mary? My best show. Got to dress up if we're going to Seattle. <laughs> Jim, we should be over Nine Mile Hill in a couple of minutes now. How low can we fly this thing? Oh, well, fly it as low as we have to. We can land any place. I've never been in one of these before. They're great for up in this country, Jim. Things certainly do look beautiful from up here. <laughs> Looks like a Christmas card. Yeah. Jeff, is that Nine Mile Hill straight ahead there? Yeah, that's it. Be over it in a few seconds now. Atkinson was right. 
There's only one set of tire tracks going up it. Well, let's follow the road. Well, there's still only one set of tracks. Well, lucky it didn't start to snow again. Jeff, look. The tracks are turning off the road. Where? On the left there, the trees. Oh, yes, I see it. There's a car down there, right next to that cabin. Yeah. I'll drop down. Sedan, Jeff. Yeah. Looks like a Buick. Left rear fender's done it. That was in the description. I'd say that was the car that was stolen from Mr. Gordon. I'm going to land in that clearing in back of the house. You warm enough, Aunt Mary? Oh, certainly. I love this weather. How about you, Slim? I just hope this face of mine turns out all right. Oh, Slim, it's going to be beautiful. How do you know? Well, the doctor showed me your face before he put the bandages on. Huh? What do I look like? Like a Greek god. Yeah, I was pretty worried about how it would turn out. <laughs> Why? Well, I smelled whiskey on the doctor's breath just before I took the, the anesthetic. Oh, he just had one little nip. Uh -huh really drunk when we left. Well, he wanted to relax after such a difficult operation. Now be a good boy and stop worrying, Slim. You're going to look fine. Aunt Mary, how long since you've been to Seattle? Oh, heaven, not for years. Oh? Well, this will be like a vacation for you then, huh? Mm -hmm, you should say so. First thing I'm going to do is go to a department store and do some shopping. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, gee, that's just like a dame. Spending all your money on clothes. Money? Gracious, Joe, I didn't say I was going to buy them. Huh? You're much too young to remember, but in my day, I was the best shoplifter west of the Mississippi. <laughs> Jeff, keep your gun drawn. Cover me. I'll throw open the front door. Okay. Here we go. Right I'm going in, Jeff. I'm right with you. Right Someone in the next room. Come on, Jeff. Let's take a look. Right. Right. I have here a little bottle of wonder syrup. It's nectar of the gods. Hello, you, Doc. Huh? Come on, Doc. Get with it. What are you doing here? I know you from someplace. Can't. Place the face. I arrested you for selling snake oil last year, remember? Oh, yes, yes, that's right, you did. Who is he, Jeff? Wonderful Old medicine showman. Calls himself a doctor. More or less the town drunk. What would he be doing here? I don't know. Look, let's show him the pictures of Crawford and Grove and see what he can tell us, huh? Good idea. Oh, uh, doctor. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Take a look at these pictures, will you? Fine pictures. Fine pictures. Yes, we know they're fine pictures. These men were here. Where are they now? Gone. Gone. Oh, gone. Well, they were very rude. I don't think he's going to be much help to us, Jim. Goodbye. We'd better look around the rest of the place and see if we can get a lead. But I know where they went. You do where? Yeah. Come on, Montgomery. Make some sense. They went to Seattle. The fellow gave me his address. You want it? Yes, of course I want it. Uh, it's... Huh? Oh, it's on a little pad. Must be in the other room. Hey, Jim, I noticed that pad on the table in there. Come on. All right. Here it is, Jim. Yeah, but there's nothing on the pad. Mm, Wait a minute, Jeff. There's some indentations. Yeah, but they're not deep enough to read. You got a flashlight? Uh-huh. Turn it on. Hold it parallel to the sheet of paper, will you? Okay. This way? That's it. There. See how that accents the indentations? Yeah. Looks like an address there, Jeff. Uh-huh. I can make it out. 4411 Canal Street, Seattle. You know, the doc could be telling the truth, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I know. I wish I could go with you, but that's across the state line and out of my territory. Well, let's fly back to the airport. I'll catch the first plane to Seattle. <laughs> Pardon. Thank you, Aunt Mary. Let's see now, can I get you anything? Well, if it wouldn't seem too rude, you could get us the money. Money? Yeah, uh, yeah, the five G's. For the doc. Oh, of course. I'll get it right now. Gee, 
You keep that much cash here? This wall safe is pretty well concealed. Mercy, I'd be afraid to see you. <laughs> I think they extend professional courtesy. Here we are. He's got a gun. That's right, Joe. Slim, you, you put that away. You, you'll hurt somebody now. I will if you two don't get out of here. What is this? Pretty apparent, isn't it? I'm saving myself $5,000. Young man, this is most unethical. It's just good business, that's all. Look, Slim, what are we going to tell the doc? Don't give me that. You had no intention of paying. But you got a new kisser. Yeah, you're wrong, Joe. What? He's still got the same face under those bandages. What are you talking about? That man wasn't a doctor. He didn't touch your face. If you're lying, I can, I can feel it. <laughs> what you feel is plain plaster. If you don't believe me, take off the bandages. See for yourself. Go ahead, take them off. I will. Is that the truth, Aunt Mary? Yes, Joe. He'll find out when he looks at himself in that mirror. Wait. You dirty... Get his gun, Joe. Right. Let it go. Oh, no. Now we take over. Good work, Joseph. Now take a look and see what Mr. Baldwin really has in that wall safe. There you are, all of you. Huh? A cop. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Well, you just arrived in time, young man. That fellow there with his face half covered with bandages is a criminal. I want you too, Mrs. Dawson. <laughs> And I'm taking these two to a jail they won't break out of. Slim Baldwin was sentenced to 20 years for theft from an interstate shipment. Joe Crawford was given two years and turned back to the local authorities for prosecution for murder. Mary Dawson received two years and a $1,000 fine, and the bogus doctor's probation was revoked, and he was returned to jail for one year. And thus, once more did cooperation between a local police officer and a special agent of your FBI result in the successful pursuit of a group of criminals. The method of reading indented writing, which led Special Agent Taylor to the address in Seattle, is only one of many skills in scientific crime investigation which form a part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes a duly authorized and qualified member of your national law enforcement agency, your FBI. my friend Jack Stone says he has one more question about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. What is it, Jack? Well, you say this chart is free, Mr. Keating, but there must be some strings attached to it. No, Jack, not one. This chart was originally created as a helpful service to members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Now it's being offered to the audience of this program. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to supply you with a chart. What you do after that is strictly your own business. So make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A revealing account of the activities of two teenage lawbreakers. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Eager Ensign. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for The Eager Ensigns on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.